The director of the National Museum of Afghanistan summed up much of what we are thinking about at the moment in particular with the words, a nation stays alive when its culture stays alive. And what we're witnessing, particularly in the last few weeks, is a systematic attempt to destroy culture and redefine national boundaries. What I'm going to now talk about are some case studies uh, and experiences and positive experiences of working with the National Museum of Afghanistan uh, in over the last few years in particular and to describe um, what can be done perhaps in connection with other countries. <coughs> Looting is or well, has been endemic in Afghanistan probably since the late 60s, is well documented through the 70s, declined during the period of the Soviet occupation, rose again dramatically during the civil war in the chaos that ensued when the museums were also targeted, fell under the Taliban years, it seems, but was replaced by iconoclastic destruction in the last year of Taliban rule of a, of a size and scale very similar to what we're witnessing today in Iraq and Syria. There were many attempts, by, particularly by private individuals, uh, to try and safeguard and record um, Afghan cultural heritage but official governmental responses, I think it has to be said, were generally very slow and late and really followed the fall of the Taliban government in 2001. In 2006, the ICOM Red List was finally launched in London. Turning to a sister institution of this, um, on the occasion of an exhibition at the British Museum in 2011, um, there was the opportunity to sign an official memorandum of understanding between the relevant directors of the British Museum and the National Museum in Kabul, and to formalize our intent to work very closely together on the issue of stolen cultural heritage, whether it be from museums in Afghanistan or from archeological sites. So I'll run through three case studies, because I know we've only got a few minutes. The first case study revolved around a group of 20 of the famous Bagram ivories, lost from the museum in Kabul uh, during the Civil War, disappeared onto the black market, tracked down by a private individual, reacquired for the museum in Kabul with the blessing of that museum, conserved and analyzed by us at the museum in London, and returned by us to Kabul. And at the end of last year, we were very pleased to announce and present in Kabul the full publication of the work we did with our colleagues there. The second case study revolves around another famous object, the largest piece of Gandharan sculpture from the museum in Kabul, which was taken one night from open display there during the Civil War, disappeared across borders into a country that is not a signatory of UNESCO, into a private collection. Its whereabouts was communicated through us to the director of the National Museum in Kabul, who gave the go-ahead for it to be acquired by any means necessary it lay beyond the power of law or UNESCO. And so a private individual did something which is often frowned on. He went and bought it because the owner would not give it back and could not be compelled to give it back. He went and bought it and he re-imported it into Britain. It was taken from the airport straight to our museum where it was inspected by curators from Kabul verified. It still had its museum number on, I have to say. Um, we exhibited it temporarily in order to maximize press attention on this event, and it is now back on display in Kabul. The third case study revolves around a different type of problem, which is a, a, a much more large scale and much more difficult problem, and that's the looting of archaeological sites, 
which has been endemic now in Afghanistan for decades. Now, over the years, um, in the last decade and a half, thousands of objects which we believe in, in the British Museum to originate in Afghanistan have been seized by UK border force with the assistance of particularly Vernon's team at the Art and Antiques Unit of the Met uh, and the HMRC. We've catalogued them uh, and we have returned them to Kabul is, as two great big consignments of objects. This process has involved a lot of people. Uh, it's involved a lot of organizations, including NGOs and the Red Cross. Uh, and it's involved the British Armed Forces also in returning uh, large quantities of material in a safe way. We've also been very um, anxious to make sure that the recording of those objects before they're sent back is done to a relatively high standard, that we hand back condition reports of those objects and that we are fully transparent in what has been sent back. And this is again from the wishes of Kabul, who have given us the green light to publish a full catalog of what we've sent. So that is my last closing slide, showing the Buddha um, from Sarai Kuja back on display, beautiful display in Kabul, and the press release uh, on the 5th of August 2012, when you can see some of the Bagram ivories and looted pieces uh, going on display in Kabul. So clearly, there are lessons to be learned from working together, and I'm talking museum to museum, organization to organization, um, across international boundaries, and involving private individuals and the trade as well, to identify, catalog, and where possible, repatriate um, pieces to countries of origin. Thank you.